the screen share is working good. So welcome everyone to the first inaugural meeting of the Frederick Architect Group. This is actually the first architect group in the state of Maryland. It's what I found out and it's also its first meeting. So today we're going to hear from Tom Letty about introductions to Salesforce Well Architected. Before we get started there, what I want to do is uh, we'll play a little game and then Justin and I will introduce ourselves. So I found this little game called Would You Rather? And typically what you do is you go between choices and figure out which you would want to do and the why. And so the topic that I have specifically is would you rather work on a project with a tight deadline or a project with a lot of design flexibility and why? And you can either come off of mute or you can post in the chat. So I'll post the question in the chat as well. So what would you rather and why? Tom, I'm going to ask you because you look like you have an opinion here. <laughs> I, uh, in theory, like the idea of design flexibility because it's a little bit more freedom, but that can be dangerous too, because it, it's real easy to end up with a lot of scope creep and uh, uh, other, you know, people trying to add things that the business doesn't really need, but it's cool features and things. So um, <clears throat> part of me wants to say design flexibility, but I know the the pitfalls of that. So uh, I yeah, I mean, when you think about it, right, there's, there's also the pitfalls for a tight deadline, right? We get an MVP that never gets upgraded or we get a system that the users have decided they don't want to use because the deadlines were too tight. We couldn't meet yeah. some requirements and we have to de-scope. So it goes both ways. Uh, what are others thinking? So Caltern is saying design flexibility and convergence models, okay. What about you, Rohit? What is your thoughts? So Nadina, uh, this is uh, like the current situation where I am uh, in, where in the enterprise architect uh, model, when we are uh, doing the solutioning. So from the Salesforce point of view, the middleware and the different system, how they are going to talk with each other, what kind of uh, architect solution we are going to design. And that would be reusable, scalable, efficient. So these are the key points in our mind to design any solution uh, for uh, uh, any kind of like uh, uh, architect solution. So these are the key points. And definitely because you need to interact with the multiple teams, with multiple system uh, from the Salesforce point of view. So definitely it hit our timeline. But uh, from Salesforce point of view, we are always in a good uh, shape. Uh, in uh, whatever the format uh, the other system wants uh, the data so we can introduce the esb and other things so there is a lot of things but yeah uh, every time like uh, i am hitting the mvp deadline okay yeah and i think a lot of people are choosing design flexibility as well i typically will go with design flexibility but then sometimes a project will go on and on and on <laughs> so sometimes i just i think about that that Somewhere there should be a middle line, right? Maybe not too tight of a deadline, but not too much flexibility, but overall good. All righty. So now we'll move on. Um, let's do our introduction. So we had our welcome and our icebreaker. Uh, my name is Nadina Lisbon. So I'm actually a Salesforce certified technical architect. I just got my certification in December. I'm also a Salesforce MVP and I work as a CRM enterprise architect at NetApp. And I'll let Justin introduce himself. Hey everybody, I'm uh, just a Salesforce technical architect um, at Vacasa and been doing Salesforce for, I think going on nine years now, just time flies. And Justin is actually my better half. So we both are running this architect group, hence our last name. So yeah, the Lisbons are running this architect group um, here in Maryland. And so for announcements that I have with uh, our group announcements, so we're looking for speakers currently. Right now we have virtual meetings that we will be doing, but we're hoping to do some of our meetings in person. So whether you want to present virtually or you want to present uh, in person, we're looking for both types of speakers. 
So I'll add the link here. And then from a next meeting perspective, we have a meeting schedule for April 18th. And so we're going to have a presenter speaking about our architect's take on data governance. I've spoken to this person and I definitely think it's a session you won't want to miss. So I'll also add that link there. And then from a Maryland perspective, the Salesforce Women in Tech group is doing demystifying uh, DevOps. And so they're going to have a speaker from Gearset come in and speak about DevOps. So I'll just add those links there. And then with uh, Salesforce uh, Trailblazer DX happening next week, there's a quest happening right now. So definitely something that you want to look at if you're going to Trailblazer uh, DX or if you want a cool uh, new community badge. And then also I included a QRC code that you'll be able to get as well, but I added the link. And then from an architect's perspective on what is happening at Trailblazer DX, um, shameless plug for the well-architected sessions. So there's going to be quite a few sessions. I grabbed some of the day one sessions that they will have, but essentially there's a lot of well-architected workshops happening. And so I think if you're going in person, definitely check these out. And then there's a lot of other overall architect sessions happening as well. So what I did was grab a list of all those architect sessions that you can look at and choose. And if you're not going um, in person, there's also virtual um, keynotes and sessions that are labeled with available in Salesforce Plus that you can look at. And shameless plug, Justin and I will be presenting at TDX. So we'll be talking about MuleSoft Composer and Amazon Event Bridge. And so shameless plug wanted to add that session in there as well. And with that, let me introduce our amazing speaker. So Tom is a architect evangelist at Salesforce. He supports the global Salesforce architect community by helping create resources, tools, and guidance to help enable architects do their best work. Tom's also a published author, a public speaker, and a marathon runner based in Chicago. And I've spoken to Tom a few on a few occasions, and recently we were speaking about enterprise architecture as well as speaking on this well-architected session. It's definitely going to be a treat. And so with that, I'll turn the floor over to you, Tom, and I'll stop sharing. Oh, thank you. Thanks for the, the great intro. And uh, yeah, I was going to say, we've, uh, we've talked a few times and it, yeah, it's always been, it's always been great. And uh, I know uh, Nadina and Justin spoke in the architect track at Dreamforce too last. Uh... Oh, yes. Um, yeah. And you are a session handler as well. <laughs> so, <laughs> so yeah, it's great. It's great to uh, to have a chance, and I'm really honored to be part of uh, part of this meeting and to have gotten the invite. So, let me share my screen really quick. And um, one second here. There we go. All right. All right, so I'm here, uh, <clears throat> like we said, to talk about Salesforce Well Architected. And give me one second to drink some water. <laughs> All right, there we go. Um, and first thing we're going to do, of course, we've got our favorite forward looking statement slide. So I'm sure everybody's seen this enough times to know that. Uh, you should make any purchasing decisions based on what's for sale and not anything we say here. I'm not gonna really be talking about products, but it's always uh, in every Salesforce presentation, we always have this. So um, I am part of the architect relations team. And uh, like Nadina said earlier, what our team does is we create the the tools and resources that architects need to be successful. So well architected is, is one of them. And uh, we're gonna get into, I'll get into a couple of the other ones really briefly in a minute, but uh, there may actually be some familiar faces on uh, on this slide. So if you know Zane Turner, if you've been to any TDX or Dreamforce keynote in the last few years, I'm sure you've seen or met Zane. Uh, she is our, she leads our team. Uh, Susanna Playstead, whose name was, uh, uh, was uh, Susanna St. Germain. So if the face looks familiar, but the name doesn't, she just got married within the last uh, few months. Uh, Mark Braga, who is, uh, he leads our the technical side of our team. So 
Mark and, and Marissa also are kind of responsible for running the architect.salesforce.com website behind the scenes. And you'll also see both of them speaking at, uh, in some of our sessions as well. And, uh, and then there's, there's me. So um, we are, Salesforce is investing really heavily in architects. So, you know, anybody that's on, uh, on this meeting, you know, it's, it's a great place to be right now. And you can kind of see the evolution of the investments we've made and the, what the results have been. So in 2019, we did our first official architect track at Dreamforce. Uh, prior to that, there were some architect sessions, but they were kind of mixed into the developer track and they weren't, there wasn't content that was uniquely intended for architects in an entire track. So we started there in 2019. 2020 was another big year because we launched our architect.salesforce.com website that has, if you, you know, if you've seen it, it's got our decision guides, diagrams, a whole bunch of other architect tools, including well-architected. And then uh, in 2021, we launched our Salesforce diagram framework that, uh, in fact, I can give you a, a quick preview of something. So if you've seen our diagram framework, there are, we have a bunch of videos online about how to build good Salesforce diagrams. We also have our kit of parts that's available in Lucidchart, and we've, there's some information on our website about that. This is Safe Harbor. It's not going to officially be announced until TDX next week, but our Salesforce diagram framework is also going to be available in Elements Cloud as well, um, which goes live possibly Friday, but if not, the plan is to announce it next week. So if you uh, if you use Elements Cloud, you'll be able to build Salesforce diagrams there as well. Yes. Yeah, you heard it here first. <laughs> Um, and then last year, right before Dreamforce, we launched Salesforce Well Architected. Uh, we've done a few other sessions and, and we're kind of getting the word out about it now, but it's, it's always great to uh, bring this framework to as many people as possible and, and explain it because it's really helpful for a lot of architects. So, so what is Well Architected? Uh, <clears throat> what I'm going to do after I get through the slides, I'm going to actually open up the framework on the website and we'll... Uh, we can walk through what all of this means, but basically what it is, Salesforce Well Architected is a framework that helps you see what health looks like and where to spend your time as an architect. So how do you really know if you're designing a, a well-architected solution that's gonna you know, be long-term, be scalable, be performant, it's gonna be secure. Uh, and it, it includes prescriptive guidance. So things that will we'll walk through all these topics and we'll talk about how you should be thinking about things as, a, as an architect that are specifically on the customer 360 platform. And it's organized around solutions that are trusted, easy and adaptable. So we call those our three pillars. So there's uh, trusted solutions that protect your stakeholders. Uh, easy solutions will deliver value quickly to your business. And then adaptable solutions will evolve as your business evolves. And we'll dig in, I'm going to do a little bit deeper dive into each one of those in a minute. But uh, the one thing whoops, that's worth pointing out is even before last year, you may have heard the term well-architected. And that's because there are other well-architected frameworks around the industry in general. So there's an AWS well-architected that's really well-known. Uh, Microsoft Azure has a well-architected framework. Google does. There's, there's a few others. Those are slightly different from ours, but they're actually complementary to ours. So if you've heard of Well-Architected and you, you have a customer that's using both AWS and Salesforce, our two frameworks can actually work together nicely. Uh, one of the key differences, if you think about all of those, you know, AWS, Google Cloud Platform, Azure, they're mostly cloud substrate providers, like their infrastructure as a service, basically. So their well-architected frameworks are designed around, you know, helping you design and deploy workloads and optimize your spend. So, you know, if you're standing up a bunch of AWS services, how do you make sure that you're standing them up correctly in a way that's not going to cost too much money for your organization and you're taking down the ones that you don't need when you don't need them and, and things like that? Um, <clears throat> they have similar uh, similar framework to ours. It's made up of a, a bunch of white papers. And then they also have some tools and like auditing and maturity scorecards. And usually their technical scope of those frameworks is around the specific cloud substrate. So AWS Well Architected is obviously about AWS. And uh, the one thing that makes our framework a little bit different is at Salesforce, we're not really an infrastructure as a service provider. We are an enterprise software provider. So our framework is designed to help you deliver value to your business quickly and design healthy solutions that are not going to create a bunch of technical debt and, and fall over 18 months after you go live with them. So 
what we do is we we focus on designing and, and road mapping healthy solutions, optimizing where to spend your time as an architect. Um, and then how we do it, we've got a similar framework. It's made up of a bunch of white papers. We have tools that are coming soon, hopefully this year, some of those similar like assessment type tools that you see in the other. Um, we don't have a specific timeline for them, but they are on our, our list of things to do in uh, this fiscal year. So we have some things that are coming up soon. And the technical scope for us is the, the Salesforce Customer 360 platform. So you won't really find a lot of information about like Marketing Cloud, for example, in the framework today. Uh, that's coming at some point. But one of the things that's worth noting is that a lot of the guidance that we give is foundational where it would apply to really any of our clouds, but you won't see necessarily see specific references to some of those uh, some of those other clouds that are outside of what we consider, consider the core platform. So, uh, so that's the scope today. And uh, I mentioned trusted, easy, and adaptable. And it sounds simple when you think of it. Well, there's only three pillars. Obviously, the architecture is more than that. But we can see that there, we can do a little bit of a deeper dive. And actually, each one of these on this slide is going to have its own subsections as well. So trusted is made up of um, security, compliance, and reliability. Uh, that is our first pillar. The other thing that's worth noting, these are in order. So when you think about where should I spend my time as an architect and what should I focus on first if I am either designing a greenfield system or maybe I'm coming into an existing system that I have to untangle it because whoever was there before that designed it didn't do a good job and they didn't document anything and I have to figure out what's going on. It's, you know, what order should I be thinking about things in? So we go from trusted, then easy, which is um, simple, which is re you know reducing the amount of over-engineering in your solutions, uh, automation, and then building engaging solutions. And then we've got adaptable, which is the evolve with the business piece. That is the only reason that's at the end is because something had to be last. It's not that it's not important, but it is. Uh, it, it, there's a lot of more advanced topics in adaptable too, like building composable solutions that are made up of. Uh, you know, pieces that modular pieces that you can switch in and out and, uh, and we'll get to that in a couple slides. But the first thing we're going to do is take a look at trusted. So trusted solutions, they, uh, they protect your business and stakeholders. And we can see that, you know, there's this secure, compliant and reliable that, uh, that I referred to earlier. So secure solutions, they protect, uh, you know, they control your access and protect data. So you want to think about things like organizational security. So authorization and authentication. Uh, session security. So even if you're, even if you've got all your authorization and uh, authentication set up correctly, are you sure somebody isn't going to hijack a, a session that, uh, that one of your users is accessing over a, you know, a public internet connection or whatever. Uh, there's data security and making sure that if somebody does gain unauthorized access somehow that you're still minimizing the amount of damage that they can do because your data itself is protected. Uh, and then from there, we talk about compliance. Uh, we have, you know, and this is used to be a really big deal, we would say in, in Europe because of GDPR, but even now in the US, more and more states are starting to uh, put regulations in place. You know, California has got a big one. There's a lot of states that have proposed regulations that have to do with how you share people's data, what data you're allowed to share, what data you're allowed to expose, and what data you're even allowed to keep. So you want to make sure that you're uh, complying with all local regulations. And then it can get a lot complicated too. There's actually, uh, speaking of TDX, we've got a session coming up on compliance at TDX that involves, what if you have a multi-org strategy where one org is in one country and another org is in a different country with different legal regulations? So how do you, what approach do you take to make sure that uh, your data is staying resident where it needs to, but your executives at the top can still uh, see overall performance of, of the company and get the data that they need? So those are some things to think about when you think about compliance. And then reliability is where we start to talk more about uh, availability. So making sure that, uh, that your system is accessible by your users. And um, I can tell you, I <clears throat> probably a lot of people have heard this or some version of it. And I know I've, I've heard it when, when I was working, when I was doing consulting and working for customers that availability, it's almost like, well, isn't that Salesforce's problem? That's why we have a cloud solution that's in their data centers. They have to worry about making sure it's available. And the answer is, well, sort of. So it, it is on us to make sure that our, uh, our data centers are up and that you're able to access our systems. But I always give this uh, um, 
a hypothetical scenario to uh, to counter that where it's like, okay, well, but imagine if you don't have good processes for deactivating users, you have a whole bunch of users that have system admin access in production when they shouldn't have it, and you're not limiting what IP addresses anyone can log in from or anything. It's everything is just wide open. And then you you have to let go somebody who has system admin access. They go home because you haven't deactivated them from Salesforce. They log in from home, deactivate all the other users, delete a bunch of data, and change a bunch of configuration. Right now, as far as Salesforce is concerned, your system is available just fine, but you're, it's not available to your users. And those are all architectural decisions that somebody could have made preemptively to uh, prevent something like that from happening. So. When we talk about availability, those are the kinds of things that we talk about. And obviously, hopefully something that extreme will never happen, but there are other things that, uh, you know, architects can, decisions that architects can make that would affect the, uh, the availability of, of an org. And we cover some of those types of topics as well. And then there's uh, performance and, uh, and scalability. So making sure that uh, your organization can, can continue to, your, your org can grow with, uh, as your org gets additional customers is taking in more records or um, or even if you're seeing seasonal volume spikes, maybe you're a retailer. Uh, there's a lot of those types of topics when we talk about performance and scalability. And some of the uh, the learnings, you know, as we were developing the framework, we asked for a lot of feedback on some of our initial draft copies from uh, from our community. And, you know, some of them were internal architects at Salesforce, the people that responded, some people were, um, you know, from the ecosystem. And some of the learnings that we had in some of the uh, the interesting discussions that we ended up having was, uh, or, you know, around specifically for trusted, we had, you know, one was authentication versus uh, authorization. So we came up with, you know, two pieces of guidance. You know, one is to create your Salesforce users based on individuals, not personas. And this one, <laughs> I have to admit, I early in my career, I did something like this. And, you know, now I kind of cringe at it, but I know we've all seen this where you, um, you'll, you'll see an org that has a user that's just called integration user or, or something to that effect. And every integration from every other system is, you know, whatever records get created are owned by that user, right? And then all of a sudden it makes it hard over time. You don't really know who the true owner is. You might end up with issues that are, you know, with data skew issues because you've got this one user that's owning tens of thousands of records. So, you know, when you when you think about how you're going to uh, create your Salesforce users, you know, having a generic integration user is not the right way to do it. And you need to think about uh, act that type of uh, access based on individuals. But when you're thinking about what your users can access, you should be thinking about that in terms of personas. So that's when we talk about the things like permission sets and permission set groups uh, being using those to give access instead of uh, individual profiles, for example. And, um, you know, the idea of permission sets this, actually we have uh, Susanna St. Germain or Susanna Playstead on my team actually just did a quick interview with uh, Cheryl Feldman for a, uh, a TDX promo that about uh, principle of least privilege. And Cheryl had the perfect way to think about it was if you think about your uh, permission sets as like jobs to be done. So somebody that needs to edit a certain type of record or somebody that needs to be able to update this type of value. They're specifically task-based. And then you think of your permission set groups in terms of the personas that would need to, to do those things. So your permission set group obviously is a collection of permission sets. So it's a good way to think about those, those two types of things as you're setting up access. Um, OWDs, this one has, we've had some heated de debates about this and I wanna explain what the, uh, what the that middle box really means. So. The, the guidance that we came up with was set your OWDs to public read only, your internal OWDs, that external one should always be private by default. Um, unless you're working with sensitive data, then obviously you should use private for internal as well. And this, the way it's written, I think is, it's a little bit confusing because what we're really saying is make sure that you're not overcomplicating your security model and that you really understand who needs to access what records. Because if you say, okay, principle of least privilege says I should provide the least amount of access and then open things up from there. I'm going to make everything private. And then what you end up doing is uh, creating a bunch of one-off sharing rules because you need to, well, these people need to see this record. And then these users need to see this other record. And then the next thing you know, 
your sharing rules are overlapping and you've got so many of them that you can't even really tell who has access to what anymore. And then you end up with your security model that it's, it's more open than you were expecting it to be. Versus if you say, you know what, actually for this particular object, public read only is probably okay. Uh, and then we're going to, let's go through and think about the ones that really need to be private. And we're going to set those to private. And then we, that way your security model stays more straightforward. And then you also don't have to worry about things like performance issues when your security rules are being recalculated and things like that. But the, really the key to this is if I were going to redo this slide, I would, I would actually just change it to like understand your data and understand your security requirements uh, before you just go choosing what to set your OWDs to, uh, you know, by default. So, and then the, um, the third one is around failure mitigation. So this one we talk about uh, triggers that can cause a, a failure. So if something happens in your Salesforce org and on the surface, almost everything, every time there's like a defect or an issue or something is going to look like it's, it's a technical issue. You know, this flow didn't work and, be, you know, because whatever happened and probably the first thing someone's going to want to do is go in and fix whatever the condition was that, that caused the failure. And, and that's fine. But what you should really be doing is looking at what, what's actually underlying what's underneath that. Like, is there a process that needs to change because this technical failure, you know, it keeps happening over and over and over again. And it's actually because our users aren't thinking about this the right way or, or something changed on the business side that nobody told us about. And we need to, we need to adjust to, uh, you know, make an update to adjust for that. But, you know, dig, dig a little deeper when you do and don't just look at things on the surface as, okay, here's this technical failure. I'm going to fix it and move on. Uh, and, you know, think about, do we have policies that we need to change? Do we have, you know, business processes that we, we need to maybe rethink or maybe redesign something in relation to that? And then when we get to um, easy, this is actually, I think, probably where Salesforce well-architected really diverges from the other well-architected frameworks. Because when you think about like security and, and compliance and performance and scalability, those are, if you're using AWS or you're using Microsoft Azure or something, those are all going to be important there as well. But in easy, this is where we talk about delivering value to the business. And this is what kind of differentiates Salesforce from just an infrastructure as a service company. So the my favorite top, my favorite tagline to use when I talk about easy too is, Easy does not mean that it's easy for you to architect. What it means is that you've made all the hard decisions as an architect to make it easy for your business users to get value from your solutions. So, um, and what we say, we can look at the description, right? Easy solutions deliver value fast. So if a solution is easy, it means it's simple, it's automated and it's engaging. And the topics we cover there are Simple, we talk about, you know, making sure that your solution is readable. So, you know, you've got good documentation and design standards uh, that it can be maintained long-term. And that's things like, you know, making sure that, uh, you know, number one, the documentation is there, but also that you're limiting the amount of customizations and that you have plans in place to mitigate technical debts. Because sometimes technical debt's gonna be unavoidable. Technical debt isn't always terrible to have as long as you have a plan for how you're going to address it over the short and long term. And then intentionality, which is where we talk about uh, the value of road mapping and how you want to make sure to use roadmaps, not just to use them, but to use them correctly and for the right audience so that your business stakeholders know what capabilities are going to be rolling out when, and your technical stakeholders know what specifically they need to plan to implement when. Uh, and then we talk about automation, which is uh, meeting business goals and objectives quickly and at scale. And here we talk about having good logic. So don't just go build a flow if you don't really understand the underlying business process and you're not even sure that that process has been optimized. Uh, a lot of times, this one, I'm sure everybody has seen this at least once, uh, if you've been working in the industry long enough to be an architect is, uh, you'll have business users that'll come up and say, well, I need this to work this way. And then you start asking them, well, well, why? And they, they can't really explain it. And, and the longer, the more questions you ask, the more it like really boils down to, well, we don't really know why we do this. We've just always done it that way. Right. <laughs> and then you have to stop and think, okay, do we, are we really going to spend the time and money to build an automation that might not even be something that you need to automate you know, anymore? Or maybe you need to be thinking about that process differently because you've been doing it for 10 years and your own business has changed since then. So 
um, you know, thinking about that. And then data integrity, we talk a lot about making sure that, you know, are, are your automations executing in user context versus system context and who has, who can actually update what records and, uh, and are you executing your automation synchronously versus asynchronously? And there, there's good times to use both of those, uh, you know, when you might want to do that. So that's more around like patterns and making sure that, uh, that your data, your underlying data that your automations are touching is going to, is going to still be, uh, isn't going to get corrupted by the work that you're doing. And then, uh, and then we also talk about business value. So, you know, do you, do you actually, you know, can you express in words the, uh, the value that your automation is, uh, is creating for the business? So either it's saving time, it's helping to generate more revenue or, you know, whatever the reason is that the automation is being built, but do you also have some KPIs that you can use to measure that, you know, actually we said this automation was going to save X number of hours per user per week. And yeah, we actually hit that target now that, you know, it's, it's been in place for six months. We can, we can say we did a good job of that. Um, and engaging this one is, this is an interesting one to me because a lot of, um, a lot of architects think of engaging as like UI UX type and, and they'll think like, well, as an architect, I'm that that's not really something I'm concerned about. We've got other team members that do that. And I always say that that's partially true. Maybe you're not going to be going and doing an actual designing an actual UI yourself, but you still need to make sure that your solutions that, you know, the, whatever forms are rolled out are streamlined. The solution is helpful. You're getting good metric. The, your users are getting good reports that will show them the value of the work that they're doing. Otherwise what ends up happening is uh, even though maybe the UX isn't your problem, but you have a bunch of users that are rushing through entering data into your, uh, into your system because they hate using your system and they just want to get out of it as quickly as possible because it's the UI isn't very intuitive and it's annoying to use. And then you end up with data quality issues, which actually now that is uh, as an architect, now that is your problem. So uh, when we talk about engaging, we talk about it kind of from that perspective. And some of our learnings around uh, easy. So documentation, this one was really funny to me because when we first asked for feedback, on, uh, on our drafts, we actually had somebody that that left us some feedback that said, well, you know, documentation, I don't know if you really want to spend a lot of time talking about this. Most people think it it takes too long and, it, and it's, it's kind of annoying to have to write up all this documentation. And we don't know if anybody's ever going to read it and it's a waste of time. And our answer to that was, yeah, no, uh, without meaningful documentation, your teams end up wasting a lot of time trying to understand your system. So you know, if, if you don't have good documentation, you're going to end up revisiting the same decisions over and over again, because you don't have a record of them. Uh, your solution, you're not going to have good solution overviews. So if you're an architect and you're helping to design a, a system, and then when you're done and you're, you know, the system is live and then you want to move on to something else, whoever takes it over again, is going to be calling you every 10 minutes with questions because you don't have, your system isn't very well documented. And you're not going to want to have to be that person that is tied to this uh, the solution you designed forever because nobody knows nobody else besides you knows how to uh, make any changes to it. And then code, you know, we talk about if anybody's writing code, obviously you should be putting comments in your code and you should be documenting the code itself really well. Um, this was another one that made me laugh because we had uh, Susanna and I presented this at um, one of the Dreamin events, and somebody asked about uh, and kind of implied that documenting their code was the only documentation that they did. So we specifically added code in here to say that, yes, you you 100% should be adding all the right comments in your code to explain what, what it's doing. That also can't be your only documentation. So you, uh, you, you know, make sure that that is part of your overall uh, set of standards around how you're, what you should be documenting and, and when. Um, and then when automation, this one, we actually have an internal team that monitors kind of the backend performance of uh, all of our customers' orgs at Salesforce. And these top two bullet points actually uh, was some feedback that they gave us because they were noticing that SOSL seems to be really underutilized by across the board by a lot of our customers because SOSL, it, it feels like it's close enough to like SQL language that somebody that maybe has a background working with relational databases, they can pretty quickly pick up on SQL and, and write a SQL query. 
whereas Sasol is a little bit more, there's a little bit more of a learning curve to it if you haven't, if you haven't used a search language like that before, but it actually can uh, make your system perform better because under the hood, um, Sasol, when, well, under the hood, whenever you're executing a Sasol query, the system will reserve resources as if it's going to do a data operation, even if all you're doing is searching. So if you just need to retrieve some text, Sasol, the system won't reserve as many, as many resources behind the scenes, and you'll get the results back a lot quickly, more quickly because of the way the tables are indexed behind the scenes and everything, versus uh, SQL. The difference if you only do it once is probably negligible, but if you have a bunch of queries that are executing by multiple users multiple times a day, what will start to happen is the, that little you know, few millisecond difference will start to add up over time. And, uh, and that's when you'll get these weird like users will say things like, well, the system just feels slow and you can't really track down what it is that making it, that's making it feel slow because there's no one query that that's slow. It's just that they're running so many queries throughout the day that it uh, that it seems like over time it seems to slow down a little bit more. So that's the recommendation there is you know make sure you understand Sasol and if all you're doing is searching for data, try to use Sasol when you can. If you uh, if you do have to write something back to the database, that is the best time to to be using a Sasol query. Uh, and then the bottom half there is uh, you know optimizing your automations. We used to give guidance that you should have one automation per object. And if you look at our Salesforce documentation, there's still some places that say that because they haven't been updated yet. Uh, the reality is that was probably good advice of five years ago when a lot of automation, you know, people were using process builder. There was no real way to control the order of execution. And some of our the tools that we had available for building automations just weren't as sophisticated as they are now. So that's why you see that uh, that mentioned and that recommendation a lot in a lot of places. But as the years have gone on, you know, now we have Flow Orchestrator. We have the ability to build subflows. You can do invocable Apex. You can, if you have record triggered automations, that uh, you can set their priorities so that you can control what order different flows execute in. And so the the way to think about it today is don't build one automation per object because what you might end up doing is cramming way too much into one giant flow that does like 15 different things. And then you have a bunch of conditional statements to see if it needs to do this or that. And that's going to be a lot harder to maintain. Uh, instead, you build a bunch of smaller, uh, a bunch of smaller flows. Maybe you even have some apex for the right use cases where apex is a little bit more performant and you can use like a, a combination of flows, subflows and vocable apex. Uh, if you want to use a tool like orchestrator to, to combine them all together, you, you can otherwise, you can have a flow executing different subflows, but uh, but the point is, think of it more from that like granular and modular perspective rather than trying to build giant automations. Um, and then recognition and rewards, um, you know, how users should be recognized at second bullet point. I, not everybody wants to see confetti every time they save a record, for example, but um, you know there are good times when you when you might want to have that type of recognition and rewards. But I think the the first bullet point is really the most relevant here, which is, you know, even just making sure that your users have good dashboards on their home screen or embedded into the record pages that will show them as they're making updates, they can see the how their progress is uh, is impacting, the, you know, their own KPIs, but even the overall organizational KPIs, so that they can see that using your system is part of something that is even, you know, bigger than themselves, maybe and it'll make them, you know, they'll, they'll feel more engaged and want to adopt, uh, you know, be more likely to adopt and, and use your system correctly. And then uh, adaptable. So this is about solutions that, uh, that evolve with the business. And uh, like I said, this is the last one, not because it's not as important as the other ones, as much as um, it's just, it, it's complicated and it's some of the more advanced architecture topics that, that we cover. So Obviously, trust is foundational and it, it's key to any solution. And then from there, we want to deliver business value. And then once, we, once we've covered those bases, let's talk about how we can make sure that uh, our solution is going to continue to evolve and you're not going to have to completely re-architect something just because a business process changed. So what we talk about there, there's two topics. Uh, one is resilience. And that's about you know, responding to unexpected changes uh, in a way that doesn't, in, in an elegant way. 
Uh, and we talk about, you know, number one is incident response. So do you actually have the right processes in place to triage production issues and, and respond to them quickly? And do you have the right team members in place? And, uh, you know, how are you going to handle something when, when there is a critical issue that brings your system down? And then continuity planning is where we cover, okay, if your system does become unavailable and, you know, maybe that's something that happened in the availability section we talked about earlier and you need to fix it. Maybe it is us, hopefully not, but, you know, but if you have an extended period of time where your users are not going to be able to access Salesforce, do you have a plan in place that will keep your business from grinding to a complete halt where, you know, your users can do whatever processes they, they need to follow? And then maybe when the system becomes available again, you've got, you've got to maybe do a, a quick update or upload some data or something, but do you have those plans in place? Um, and then we also talk about ALM, which is making sure that you have a good environment strategy and release strategy. And the reason that we have that under resilient is because the idea is that if you have good ALM processes, it's going to reduce the likelihood of a, like a, a critical error being introduced in, or a, a critical defect being introduced into production that brings down your entire system. Not saying it won't happen, but it'll, you, if you've got all the right environment strategies set up you've done all the right testing in the right environments ahead of time. And then by the time something does get into production, you know, hopefully you've got a, uh, a backup plan as well so that you can, you can reverse your changes easily. So that's why we've got ALM uh, sitting under resilient. Uh, and then composable is where we talk about um, breaking your system down into modular units that can work together well. And uh, actually, the, the interesting thing is uh, our friends over at MuleSoft talk about composability quite a bit. So I know uh, if, uh, if, if you're doing a session, uh, Nadina and Justin, on uh, MuleSoft Composer, this is probably a, a topic that, you know, it, it's at least been mentioned at, at some point about the idea of thinking about, um, you know, your separation of concerns. You know, what are the, your, the different business units that, you're, that are going to be using your system or systems, plural? Um, you know, what do they have that is unique to them? What do they have that's common? How do you want to structure that in a way that will allow them to, uh, you know, to work together, but still be autonomous? So if you introduce a, a change to one business unit, it'll have minimal effects on the other ones. And then integrability, it's also interoperability is a, another way to determine that. But as you, as you build your, all these separate units, are they able to communicate and share data with each other uh, uh, correctly? And, uh, in a, and in a way that uh, will continue to let your organization function well. Because if we talk about loose coupling a lot in our composable section, and it's great if you bunch, build a bunch of individual one-off units, but if they can't communicate with each other and share data, then you've just got, it's, it's like having a big pile of Lego blocks that aren't connected together any, anyway. So uh, that's what inter, where interoperability comes in. But, and, um, and then the last one is packageability. So you've, you've got all your units, you know how they're, connected to each other, you've identified which units are dependent on which other ones, which ones can function independently. Now, how are you going to package those in a way that will allow you to deploy them either into a single org that maybe you have multiple business units working in? And kind of like I said, you wanna, you'll want the changes to one like business unit to be a, as non-disruptive as possible to all of the other ones. Uh, or you might even be doing this in multiple orgs, right? So one of the the advantages of using packaging is that you can package changes up in a development org and deploy it to multiple, uh, you know, multiple production orgs if you uh, if you have a multi org strategy. And some of our learnings from that were um, around app lifecycle management. So our biggest advice here is stop using change sets for org based development. Um, I I know packaging especially when you're looking at smaller organizations that in the, you know, may not have been as mature and maybe their development teams or, you know, they don't, maybe they don't even have full-time development teams. They're not familiar with uh, some of the concepts around packaging and it might be a learning curve for them. That's okay. DevOps center is still better than change sets. So, you know, make sure that you're using the, the most stable release mechanism possible. That's appropriate for the, the org that you're using. And, uh, the other thing that I would add in here that's not on this slide, but uh, is using source control too. So don't, you know, if, if you're not using source control, what that essentially means is that your production org is the source of truth for all of your, your metadata. And if, uh, 
you know, the only way you can get the latest metadata in a non-production environment is to refresh it or, or spin up a new one or whatever. And you don't want to, you don't want to be in that situation. There's a lot of issues that can come out from that. So using source control combined with whether you're using packaging DevOps center or whatever it is to migrate your changes through your environments. And then, you know, also it's not on this slide, but having a good environment strategy and knowing what type of work is being done in each type of uh, sandbox environment or potentially scratch org if you're if you're using scratch orgs um, and then composability this is kind of what i mentioned earlier on the last slide but just in a nice uh, diagram form so in the middle we've got our our functional units which are uh, a specific operation or a job that uh, that can operate on its own that's independent of others uh, you've got a way to manage state and then you've also uh you know you also know the next level up is how does it interoperate with uh with the other ones so are you using events and notifications is there a specific communication protocol that you need to use and then from there you you can go a level up and talk about okay now that we we have all this how do we package it together and uh and make sure that we're uh you know that we know how to deploy those packages as needed and so the next thing I want to do is talk about not just that. So that's the framework. And I'm going to actually open it up after I've got a couple more slides and we'll, we'll take a look at what the framework itself looks like and what you can find there. Uh, before that, what I'd like to do is tell a little bit of a story about what a well-architected solution really looks like. And to make it a little bit fun, it's actually not going to be Salesforce, but there are a lot of tie-ins to it. And instead, it's going to be about beer. Um, so... To give you a little bit of background, I, uh, I used to work in the beer industry, and in addition to my Salesforce certifications, I actually have a Cicerone certification, which is literally, I'm a certified beer expert. So as we were developing our well-architected framework, I thought of this story and thought it would be a good, a good way to, to share some, uh, something that I had learned at one of my older roles in a way that's actually still relevant, and it, it's kind of a fun story. So the first thing I want to talk about is... Um, Actually, what I'm going to do for a minute is I'm going to stop sharing my screen and I'm going to ask how many people have seen one of these before? It's this old German beer stein uh, that you could drink. Yeah, you see it. it. It's a decoration that you see at a lot of uh, a lot of pubs now, especially old like German pubs. What people don't realize is this actually used to have a functional use about maybe 300 years ago. There was a reason that people would drink beer out of this. And the reason was because beer was disgusting. Uh, if you think about what beer looks like now, back then, it was always this weird off color. There were things floating around in it because nobody knew how to filter water correctly. Um, it smelled really bad. So that's what the top was for. So you could kind of like open it up, take a sip and then close it and put, put down your glass. The reason that it's a solid pewter color is so that people didn't have to look in it and, and actually see what they were drinking. And uh, it, was, it was just completely disgusting. And you may think, okay, well, why would somebody even drink something like that? And the reason is because back then water was actually worse. Uh, this was during a time where before anybody knew about things like germ theory and didn't realize that bringing your farm animals to a stream and letting them bathe in some water and then scooping out a bucket of water and from that same stream and bringing it home for your family to drink is probably not a great idea. So this was a really gross time to be alive, let me tell you. Uh, so anyway, what happened was people didn't really understand the science behind it, but what was really going on behind the scenes was that the alcohol in the beer would kill a lot of the bacteria that was making people sick when they would just drink regular water. So maybe they didn't understand why, but they understood that if I drink water, I'm probably going to get sick. If I drink beer, I most likely won't. So I'll, I'll just drink beer, even though beer is nasty. And that was pretty much where uh, uh, where a lot of uh, beer traditions came from. So let me share my screen again. And uh, one of the things that happened during this time period was in a town called Pilsen, which is in, uh, it's in the Czech Republic now. It's back then, I mean, we're, we're talking 300 years ago. What It was... Um, I think, you know, it might've been part of Germany. It's changed hands a bunch of times. It's been part of, considered part of Poland for a while, but there was this town. So Pilsen was there. And what happened in Pilsen was people were actually getting sick, even from the beer that they were drinking. So 
when you think about how bad that has to be, whatever bacteria is in that beer is strong enough to survive being an alcohol and still be strong enough to make somebody sick when they drink it. That's some pretty strong, uh, some pretty strong bacteria. So the people that lived in Pilsen finally got tired of getting sick, no matter what they tried to drink or eat or whatever. So at one point they got so fed up with it that they went into the brewery, they kicked over all the barrels of beer, they ran the brewmaster out of the brewery, ran him out of town and said, oh, get out, we're done. And that solved their problem of now their beer's not making them sick, but they also, it didn't fix the problem because the water was still making them sick and now they just didn't have any more beer. So next we have the hero of our story. His name is Joseph Grohl. And Joseph Grohl was a brewmaster from uh, Bavaria. And he was the son of another brewmaster who had been brewing beer in a traditional way for his entire life. And I think his, even his grandfather was a brewmaster. They had a long lineage of brewers. And Joseph Grohl had all these ideas for things that he wanted to change about the brewing process. But his father was really conservative and like liked to do things the traditional way and just told him, no, I don't want to I don't want to try any of your new ways. So he decided to leave Bavaria and go to Pilsen and apply for a job that he had heard that there was a job opening for a brewmaster. So he said, great, I'm going to be your new brewmaster. And Joseph Grohl ended up uh, spending about six months just ripping all of the equipment out of the brewery redesigning everything from scratch. He added new filtration. He created the, uh, the big copper, they're called mash tunes that you see at a lot of brew pubs. He put better uh, seals on those so that they'd be airtight. He came up with new processes to brew beer. And then, you know, everyone sees him working in the brewery late at night and they're wondering, what is this crazy guy doing? Finally, about six months later, he brews his first batch of beer and he calls a meeting for the entire town to come out when he, and he walks out of the brewery and instead of using one of these beer steins, he walks out with a glass, just a, a clear glass of beer, and he holds it up to the light, and the sunlight is shining through it, and you, you don't see things that are floating in it. It's, it looks like a, the way you'd see uh, beer today. And he makes this announcement that uh, to the townspeople that I have brewed the world's first golden beer. And he let everybody try it. It tasted the way beer is supposed to taste. It, you know, went down easy. It was basically uh, very similar to what you would see today. And in fact, what happened was, you know, and then nobody got sick, which is obviously the, the other bonus. And what happened was his brewing techniques spread throughout the rest of Europe and then eventually throughout the rest of the world. And it's been hundreds of years and so many different things have changed in the, in the beer industry since then. But And there's so many different styles of beer, craft beers, large breweries, everything. But still to this day, you know, even though there's different styles, there's different manufacturers, there's everything is a lot more different in the modern world. No matter what kind of beer you drink, the brewing techniques that were used to brew it are still based off of Joseph Grohl's original techniques. And they've survived and evolved over the years for, uh, for hundreds of years. So what does that have to do with Well Architected? Well, let's go back a little bit and look at our framework and we can see that we have trusted. So the, uh, so the fact that I'm not going to get sick when I drink this beer is, <laughs> it makes me trust it. You know, it feels good to know that, right? So it's, uh, it's also easy. I don't have to drink it out of a special kind of glass anymore. I can drink it out of whatever I have. And it also goes down easy and I don't have to worry about swallowing random chunks of things while I'm, while I'm drinking it. And it's adaptable. So it has, you know, over 300 years, the industry's evolved. So many things have changed with the way people, you know, the reasons people drink beer, the way society looks at beer. But, you know, Joseph Grohl's original brewing techniques are still in place today, uh, just a modernized version of them, basically. So it has evolved over the years. So congratulations to Joseph Grohl for developing a well-architected solution 300 years before well-architected was even a thing. And when you think about what that means for you, for your Salesforce solutions, it's the same, it, similar ideas, right? So, you know, you should be building solutions that are trusted, that people feel safe using your solutions and they know that they're complying with, with laws and that they're going to be reliable. Uh, they should be easy to use. So we, we talked about, you know, what the, what the different uh, topics are under easy. So they should be simple, not over-engineered. They should be, there should be good automations. They should be engaging. People should want to use them. And they should be adaptable. So they should respond to uh, any unexpected changes elegantly. And if you can compose them into meaningful units and make it easy for uh, 
for your solutions to get deployed in ways that uh, have minimal disruption to your different business units, that's even better. So that is the, uh, that's my parallel between my, my old job working in the beer industry and, and Salesforce and what it well architected means. So, and I think the, uh, the last thing we've got is one last slide, which is what's next. So um, if you haven't seen our uh, intro to well architected videos, uh, if you take a look at the Salesforce Architects YouTube channel, Susanna and I recorded a bunch of really short, they're about five minutes each, but we walk into, or we walk through each um, topic in the framework and we, we talk about what it is, what it means and, uh, and how to think about it. And we also have, if anybody is going to be at TDX next week, we have some well-architected workshops where you'll actually get to get hands-on with the, with the framework. And the way these are going to work is that we will uh, walk through kind of the, an intro to each topic. Well, there's a, one workshop aligned with each topic. We'll walk through an intro and then we're going to give uh, everybody in the workshop a challenge to solve where it's like a scenario about this company wants to do these things get together in your group and everybody will get to work together around uh, a whiteboard and come up with a well-architected solution. And then we'll get to do readouts and, and discuss these solutions. We actually did something similar at Dreamforce. So if you were at Dreamforce last year, you may have seen these. It'll be similar concept, but some new updated scenarios as well. So uh, we'd love to see you there for that. And the one other thing I wanna do, so I love going through these slides and that's great, but, um, I think what's really valuable is, you know, the slides are kind of theoretical. So let's actually take a look at what the framework really looks like. And I am going to reshare my screen. And that is here. So uh, if you haven't seen architect.salesforce.com, uh, this is where you'll find the well-architected framework. And you can see we've got this get started button. There's also a menu up here that has uh, all the well-architected, the entire framework. Um, the other thing I want to call out to is under this resources tab, there are two resources that you might want to look at. One is this one is called the platform multi-tenant architecture. This document has, I'll click into it. It has a lot of information about how Salesforce works behind the scenes. So these are the things that as an architect, you don't have any control over. There are the things that our engineering team have designed around how indexes work and what really happens in the Salesforce database behind the scenes when you add a custom object, for example. Um, it, it covers a lot of that. And knowing this, these things, like I said, there's nothing that you can necessarily do to change this as an architect, but understanding how all of these things are working is gonna help you make good architectural decisions. So this will be, it's not technically part of the well-architected framework, but we do um, reference it quite a bit. So this is, it's definitely worth checking out. Uh, we also have this architecture basics, which is kind of a link between this platform multi-tenant architecture and well-architected. So this is maybe a level higher where we start talking about, um, you know, API limits and um, execution context, uh, order of uh, operations. There's our, uh, our diagram in there. So this one is, uh, you could probably read that next if you haven't, if you aren't familiar with some of these topics. And then from there, we can go into the actual framework itself and we can see that um, at the beginning, we've got an overview. Here's the same uh, uh, structure that I mentioned earlier and, uh, and some definitions. And then you can see we keep going down you know, to each lower level. So we can go from the overview, we can go down to trusted. Trusted kind of has, a, okay, here's what you need to think about as, as an architect and, and you know, why you should care. And then we start going, by the time we get to this third level is where really the, like the meaty portion of the framework is. And these, you can see they're, they're pretty long. There are a lot of text. Um, it, it is, it is a lot to read, but I, if I, I want to break down the way that these are all structured so that uh, hopefully it will, uh, it'll, it'll make a little bit more sense if you know the structure. So every one of these, so I clicked into secure, but I could have really clicked any of them. They're all kind of organized the same way. So at the beginning, we've got an introduction, which basically covers what is this topic? Why is it important to you? Like, why should you care about it as an architect? And then we go into the, the subsections, which is where we have our more prescriptive guidance. So how should I be thinking about organizational security as an architect? And what are the specific topics that I'm going to care about? And, um, and then as we scroll down a little further, we will get to a table that has a list of patterns and anti-patterns. So 
these are things that you can physically look for either in your org. Some of them, if you notice, this top one actually talks about design standards and documentation. Uh, some of them are a little more specific. So if you're using Lightning Web Components or Apex or Aura, but the, the point is these are things you should be able to physically see in your org. Hopefully the things in the pattern column are what you'll see. Uh, and then the things in the anti-patterns column are the things that if you see these, you might want to rethink your approach and maybe you need to have a discussion with your business stakeholders to let them know that before we build anything more on top of this this org we need to refactor some things or you know whatever it is but the the idea is if you see anything in the anti-patterns uh column you might need to to rethink your your approach on something and and if you notice there's these patterns and anti-patterns table they uh they repeat and actually this whole same format repeats multiple times throughout each uh, each section. And then when we get down to the bottom, we've got a list of tools that are relevant to the, the specific topic that's being covered. And tools are, um, we look at them as, th these are things that you can, you can actually use within your org to, um, to meet whatever needs, whatever requirements you have. And we tried to organize this table in a way that, uh, that tells you which specific subtopic they align to as well. Um, they've got links to the documentation. And these are a mix of, you know, most of these are, are free tools that we wanted to make sure people know because maybe not everybody you know knows that these are available or are aware of how to use them. So we try to make that. There are some uh, tools also that are paid tools. So like there's some, some of the components of Shield are in here, for example. And we did try to call out whenever it's a tool that you're going to need to purchase additional licenses for versus one that it's, it's actually there and you just need to, to start using it. And then, um, and then resources is the last table. And this is the difference between resources and tools is that while tools are things you can actually configure and use, resources are links to additional documentation. So maybe it's the help documentation or maybe it's a blog post that we thought was really good or just anything that uh, you can go a little deeper and read a little bit more about a topic than what we specifically covered in uh, in the framework. And then the last part is every one of these pages also has this "tell us what you think." Uh, so this is a it's a it's a survey, but it's really what we're what we're using for feedback. So if you have anything, if if you read through any of these and you think that we missed a topic or there's a resource that you'd like to see us add or anything. We always love to get feedback so that we can continue to improve the, the platform and, and uh, iterate on it. So, so that is, uh, I think that's everything I had. <laughs> thank you so much, Tom, for the amazing presentation. Oh, we you. have a few questions. And then if anyone has any questions they want to ask, please feel free to come off of mute. So Rohit, I think you had two questions if you yep. want to ask them. So Tom, you mentioned like uh, basically in larger uh, data volume or large data volume, how we are going to utilize uh, socials and uh, the business requirement is like whatever the record is there, we want to view it in a particular uh, <coughs> table tabular format or in a grid format. And we want to pull all those records. So like uh, they can navigate between the record and just view that. But social cannot uh, fulfill like there is again governor limit. You cannot go beyond uh, 2K records. Yeah. So in that case, like uh, how we can convince or like uh, to mention, even if I put the filters or different things, but again, the my data size is more than 2K. Yeah. That, that is a challenge where like uh, how we can use the social. That is um, that is one of the the limitations of Sassel, you're right. And there's a few ways to think about that. So um, one is if uh, if you have somebody that's giving you a requirement of I need to see I need you to return two thousand records and I need to see all or more than two thousand records and I need to see all of them. I think my first question is, really, are you really going to be looking at every line of you know two thousand plus records or you know what? Do you, and I know that that's that's not an easy conversation. I have business, so you might have business stakeholders. Yeah, I absolutely am. And it's like okay, well then. Well then, okay. I guess we're you know in, in that case, then you know, you, you, Sasol might not be an option for you. There. Yep. But uh, but I think that's that's one of those things where you you might need to push back sometimes in in, uh, in those solutions or in those scenarios. But um, uh, and then the other thing is, you know, the, it's worth noting that Sasol actually 
it doesn't return records the same way that Sockwell does. It returns S objects. So yep. there is an extra step there where you need to, to cast it as a record. And there's, there's ways to do that, but it's, it's worth mentioning that, uh, uh, that that's one of the, the nuances to using Sossel. Yep. And I think my cat came to say hello. So there you go. <laughs> And then, hey, and then Chris, you had a question as well. Yes, I did. Uh, but before the question, Tom, amazing presentation. Thank you. This is actually my second time seeing this presentation intentionally because it was so good the first time I wanted to see it again. Um, and I'm also a beer nerd. So, awesome. oh, <laughs> yeah, love it. Uh, actually, uh... in fact, Quick note then, if you're a beer nerd, uh, Joseph Grohl's, uh, the beer that he brewed is still, it's Pilsner or Kell. Pilsner or Kell, yeah. yeah. <laughs> totally, that's one, one of my favorites. Um, yeah, so my question though is, you know, I've, I've um, been doing this for a while and worked in a few orgs that followed the guidance of one automation per object. Yeah. Um, and I was wondering if you had any advice or resources or best practices on how to unwind from that. Um, and like, have you seen people unwind from it or have you like, are there any gotchas to look out for um, that sort of thing? Yeah. Some of the, I think the biggest gotcha that you have to think about is if you have, um, hold on. my cat wants to treat is why she's here. So let me <laughs> do that. So she stops walking. Um, the biggest gotcha, I think, is if you're going from like one big monolith flow, for example, but it could also be a trigger, it could be whatever, but into a bunch of smaller ones is um, there could be, you have to make sure that you're doing a thorough testing so you don't end up accidentally losing some functionality that, uh, you know, somebody built into the, the big flow and you didn't realize that uh, what something was doing or it didn't translate as easy when you when you start to modularize things. And let me see, are we connected on like LinkedIn or? Uh, if we're not, we can be. Yeah, yeah, feel free to, okay. I, and I would say anybody, feel free to connect with me. But I would say, let me know, yeah, send me a message and remind me because I'll see if I can find any resources internally that like our product teams have recommended. Because for me, it's always been brute force. Let's take a look at what this does and sketch it out and refactor things, how, and you know, how we can, uh, how we can break it down and modularize it, which works, but it can also be, it can be rough and it, it's not, uh, I, I'm not, uh, I'm not convinced that's the best way to do it. So I'm, I'm happy to look at, uh, anything that our product or engineering teams have that are, uh, recommendations for our customers and share them. Awesome. Thank you. So Tom, yeah. one more question here. So continue to that uh, flow part, okay? So in that, like, uh, uh, in the orchestration, you can control the flow, like uh, after this particular subflow, which is the next one. But if yeah. I'm not creating the orchestration, can I control the uh, uh, flow, like uh, which one will execute first? If you, so yeah, if you have orchestrator, that's pretty easy to, to do if you're using, um, I know one of the, the challenges with orchestrator is you get, you know, you, you can use it for free for a certain number of times and then uh, then you start getting charged for it. And if you have a big complicated, and I think I, I don't off the top of my head, remember the licensing costs and this, it would I have to give the disclaimer of make sure you're talking to an AE, <laughs> but yep. if I remember right, I think it's like per interview or something like that. So um, it, that, that can add up pretty quickly. I, and so, yeah, so orchestrator makes it easy. If you're not using orchestrator, if you have an async path in, um, in flow that has like, let's say you have a bunch of steps with invocable apex and you've got uh, apex running behind the scenes, let me verify if those, so they, I will tell you, they don't execute until after the, um, the, the synchronous path finishes, but then I, I believe they all just kind of execute in parallel, but uh, yeah. So I, I think that's, that would be something to, to think about as your, um, as your scheduling flows. Cause one of the, one of the challenges is you shouldn't be using like, you know, you, you should, 
it's not that you shouldn't use them. You should try to avoid using like, you know, weights and things like that where uh, you don't want, you know, you, you want to, there's a whole art to orchestrating your, uh, your automations that. Uh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Thanks. Sure. Any other questions from everyone else? And, uh, and Justin, I was going to say, I just saw your response in the chat that looks, yeah, that's a, that's the best way to start, you know, build your test first to get everything uh, covered and make sure and then, and then start breaking things apart. But, um, but yeah, that's, uh, I think the, the biggest challenge and then, and that was the second piece of it is it's sometimes it's impossible to test all the unknowns and the, if you've got an older org that somebody built this giant monolith flow five years ago and didn't document it. And uh, that's where the, unfortunately <laughs> you, you're more than, that's when you start to get more likely to miss things that, uh, you know, somebody didn't, that, you know, the person that built it isn't even here before. And there's nobody to answer your question of why are these things even connected the way that they are? And we need to, uh, we need to figure this out. So it's yeah document test as much as you can document as much as you can and then as you break things apart the other the other thing i would add to that too is as you start pulling pieces out um you know make sure that the you know your tests are still you know that they're still functioning the way that you want like don't break the whole thing apart all at once and be like all right hope it works you know um so, so, so uh but it it's a it's it's a painful process. I think no matter what you, no matter what way you try to approach it. So. Yeah, there is no one size fits all for that answer. It's, it's, it's difficult and very painful. Yeah. The end result is usually worth the effort, but it, while you're actually doing it, it's uh, it can be rough. <laughs> it's also hard to justify that to leadership sometimes because they don't understand that you know doing this is in the best interest of the org it's hard to convey that because it doesn't add it's not immediately apparent to them how it adds value um yeah we actually have um i think it's in simple under maintainability we actually have a a, a note about how you should make like technical debt remediation should not just be an IT led uh, effort. Like it, it should be your business stakeholders should be involved as well. Cause you're right. That's, it's a difficult conversation to have when it's like, so the end result is this is going to actually do the same thing that it already does today, but it's just going to be quote unquote better. You know, like how do you convince somebody to spend money on something like that? That's, you know, I, I know if I was a, uh, uh, you know, an executive stakeholder that didn't really understand like IT architecture or anything, I'd be like, so what am, what am I paying you for exactly? So, mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But that is, if you can, yeah, if you can, if you can work it into where, you know, you've, you've got a plan for technical debt remediation and your, your business stakeholders understand what technical debt is and why you sometimes, Sometimes making it, yeah, it still does the same thing, but it's just better, you know, under the hood is actually a, the best approach that you can take and it's worth spending the money on. Then it, having some of those conversations up front is, uh, can be really helpful too. Yep. The thing I was going to bring up, Tom, is it, when we're refactoring things to make them better, yeah. it, is there anything that comes to mind? for you on when you differentiate between kind of like functional testing to make sure that you're refactoring it so it still works versus, you know, like quote unquote performance testing so that, you know, it'll scale. I, I don't know if, if, if there's anything that that sort of brings to mind for you, but I just, I was wondering if you had any thoughts on different functional and performance testing. Yeah, that's a, I, I don't know if there's anything specific that comes to mind, but that is a good point that you you really should be doing both because um, just because you break up your your uh, automation into a bunch of sub automations, if those sub automations aren't designed well and uh, and then they they don't perform as well, then you know not only is that then not you know that's that doesn't necessarily make it better just because it's uh, it's smaller you know it's a bunch of smaller pieces, but 
also then your business stakeholders that you said, hey, this is going to do the same thing, but it's uh, it's quote unquote better. And then it doesn't perform as well as it used to. That's going to be an even harder <laughs> discussion. So um, I don't know that there's a, a recommended process for that other than to say that you definitely need to be be thinking of things and uh, from like both of those angles for sure. And also Bill, it's great to see. <laughs> I think yeah, another no, thing to add there is to also look at the business process. So as you're breaking up this monolithic flow end to end, see that business process is still doing what you need for it to do. So essentially, can you optimize the business process, which would help optimize the flow as well? Yeah, I think that was actually, yeah, that's a, it's a good note because I was actually thinking about that as we were talking that, you know, one of the other things we talked about is making sure that you're business processes are optimized before you build an automation. But while you're, if you're refactoring one, that is a good opportunity to do that as well. Because if it is a, a giant flow that someone designed, you know, years ago or whatever, then it, maybe that made sense at the time because your business process was what it was back then. But this could also be an opportunity to say, you know what, actually let's take a look at this process before we even redesign anything and make sure that this is even still the way you want to be doing business and uh that could make the conversation with your business stakeholders a little bit easier too of you know we, we need to do this because for technical reasons it's going to be better but also it, there's going to be some business value because we're redesigning this flow in a or you know trigger or whatever it is in a, in a way that is going to um provide more value to the business and now it actually now you do want to you know it is worth paying for and I kind of think that the business process um, focus is a good way to prioritize the 10% that you should performance test. Like, you know, if, if you look at the business process and what the business cares about the most, then maybe that helps you not performance test everything, but just performance test the part of it that is maybe the biggest priority and or exposure and easier said than done. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, but that is a good uh, that is a good note too. Yeah, we'll say something that I've I do, and it's maybe not the best advice is if I get a ticket for an enhancement to existing um, automation or processes, and while I'm looking at, it, I do find technical debt. I'll kind of put a buffer into the ticket that I'm working on, or my team's going to be working on, and mention it in the ticket that we need to resolve or refactor this or re fix something in there and make our ticket slightly larger because yeah. I found in in the past business isn't really as worried about fixing things that are legacy or making things work better. But if you kind of just buffer it into your ticket a little bit and make it a slightly larger, they will like they'll be okay with it because they're getting the thing that they want as well. Yeah. That's a good yeah, that's a good call too. Um I was I I know you're saying that maybe not the best way to do it, but I, I've done that in the past too. So yeah, uh, sometimes it's it, easier. Yeah, it is. Yeah. And uh, you know, the other thing to think about too, is just in general of, um, you know, having good governance in, in place where if you've got a, a COE that can, you know, you could be working with that understands the, uh, the need to remediate technical debt that can, that can help as well. Uh, yeah, thank you, Dar. Any other questions? Uh, otherwise, this was this was great. Yeah, thanks for having me, and uh, it's great to see everybody and, and great conversation too. Yeah, thank you so much for presenting, Tom, and thanks to everyone who came tonight. So look forward for everyone to come to our next meeting, and then hopefully we'll do some in person as well, but we'll always try to have a virtual component. <laughs>